It was in 1939 that Winston Churchill famously defined Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. The Soviet Union's atom bomb project could certainly be considered a riddle, a mystery, and an enigma. Such was its secrecy at the time. Progress Abroad Russia had been conducting independent research into radioactive elements as early as 1910, long before it even became the Soviet Union, or USSR. By the 1930s, Russian scientists had made remarkable efforts towards the advancement of physics research, even with setbacks such as the 1917 October Revolution and the bloody Civil War of 1922. Scientists tend to be a sharing community. That's why Russian physicist Georgi Flirov became suspicious in 1942 that the Allied powers were secretly developing an atomic superweapon when his literature search showed that no one in the West was writing on nuclear fission. And so he wrote an urgent letter to Joseph Stalin, pleading with him to start a Soviet atomic program. Notable, too, is a report dated February 28, 1945, and written for Lavrian Tiberia, Stalin's right-hand man and the head of the NKVD, the country's dreaded secret police. The report was titled, Progress of the Atomic Bomb Abroad, and stated that it was expected the United States would produce an atomic bomb by July of that year. Los Arzamas. However, Stalin was only finally galvanized in the immediate aftermath of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that ended the Pacific War in August 1945. Immediately after those atomic bombings in Japan, the Soviet Politburo took control of the country's nuclear bomb project by establishing a special committee to oversee the development of nuclear weapons. That same year, the Arzamas 16 site near Moscow was established under Yakov Zeldovich and Yuli Hariton, who performed calculations on nuclear combustion theory alongside Isaac Pomaranchuk. The city, once known as Arzamas 16, was before and is now again called Sarov. It was the Soviet equivalent of America's Los Alamos site in New Mexico. Apparently, the Soviet bomb scientists even liked to call the place Los Arzamas. Work on the program was carried out quickly, resulting in the first nuclear reactor near Moscow in October 1946. Reactor F-1 was a research reactor operated by the Kurchatov Institute in Moscow, Russia, that reached criticality on December 25, 1946. It became the first nuclear reactor in Europe to achieve a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. It remains a functional operating nuclear reactor and is the oldest functioning reactor in the world. Closed cities. Reactor A was a military production reactor in Chelyabinsk, running on natural uranium fuel, with graphite as the moderator. It was up and running by June 1948 and provided plutonium for the first Soviet atomic bomb. It remains one of the most extensive nuclear facilities in Russia to this day. Uranium. That was the main problem for the Soviets. The United States and the United Kingdom had worked feverishly to secure a monopoly on all known world supplies of uranium ore, primarily those in the Congo, South Africa, and Canada. Soviet scientists even despaired that they could never produce an atom bomb, such was the critical importance of uranium. The Soviets would initially rely on a mine at Tabashar in what is now modern-day Tajikistan, which was mined extensively for uranium from 1943. Tabashar would be the first of at least nine officially secret Soviet closed cities known as Atomgrads, and which were related to uranium mining and production. Some of these remain closed cities to this day, including the aforementioned Sarov. Notes from the inside. It was in 2009 that Rosatom, the Russian State Nuclear Agency Corporation, began publishing impressive amounts of raw historical documents about the Soviet bomb project as part of their ongoing series titled Atomny Project SSSR, or the USSR Atomic Project. Documents released include a report dated January 28, 1946, titled Notes on the Design of the Atomic Bomb, with a description of the construction of the Explosion Inside type bomb. It was clearly a Soviet description of Trinity, the name of the first American atomic bomb detonated in the New Mexican desert on July 16, 1945. It was all based on intelligence received from Soviet spies at Los Alamos. Other reports referred directly to a Soviet spy named Klaus Fuchs, who was one of the most critical sources of intelligence for the Soviet bomb program. Atomic Spies 
The network of Soviet spies, particularly those embedded within the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, is legendary. This espionage counted on many spies, both American and foreign. There were many communist sympathizers in the U.S. during the 1940s. This willingness to share classified information with the Soviets increased when the Soviet Union faced possible defeat during the Nazi-German invasion in World War II. The leading Soviet spy was Klaus Fuchs, a German refugee theoretical physicist who worked with the British delegation at Los Alamos. He was eventually discovered, confessed, and sentenced to jail in Britain. He was later released and emigrated to what was then East Germany. Fuchs is considered to have been the most valuable of the Soviet Union's so-called atomic spies in terms of the information he gave to the USSR. This was due to his intimate knowledge of many aspects of the Manhattan Project, as well as his extensive technical knowledge. Another Soviet spy was Swiss-born American Harry Gold, who was used for industrial espionage in the American chemical industry and for acting as a courier between Klaus Fuchs and their Soviet handlers. Further knowledge and technical information was also passed on to the Soviets by the American Theodore Hall, a theoretical physicist. Hall provided detailed descriptions of the fat man plutonium bomb and of several processes for purifying plutonium to Soviet intelligence. Many of these secrets were turned over to Seville Sachs, an American who acted as a Soviet courier and who recruited Hall. The two had been roommates at Harvard College. Venona Project. The existence of Russian spies had already been exposed by the U.S. Army's secretive Venona project in 1943. However, later scholarship has disputed just how pivotal this espionage was to Soviet atomic bomb plans. It is contended by some that the Soviets merely used the stolen blueprints to reconfirm their own calculations and assumptions. Alexei Koyevnikov is a historian of Soviet science who has estimated that the principal way in which the espionage may have sped up the Soviet project was that it allowed the Soviets to avoid dangerous tests to determine the size of the bomb's critical mass. This unknown factor was called tickling the dragon's tail by the Americans. It consumed a good deal of time at Los Alamos and claimed at least two lives, namely those of scientists Harry Daglian and Louis Slotin. However, Soviet intelligence officers believed that the atomic espionage was the greatest achievement of the Soviet Union's intelligence community. In a 1999 interview, a KGB colonel, Igor Pralin, quotes a former deputy director of the CIA, who stated that, quote, The atomic espionage and the success of the Soviet intelligence in obtaining the atomic secrets of the United States is the greatest achievement of all the intelligence services of all the times. First Lightning the first Soviet atomic test was internally codenamed First Lightning and took place on August 29, 1949. The test was codenamed Joe 1 by the Americans. The design was very similar to the first U.S. Fat Man plutonium bomb, using a TNT and hexogen implosion lens design. The test took place at the Semyopolitinsk test site in what is modern-day Kazakhstan. The codename for the test site was thought to be Polygon, although the word in Russian actually refers to any kind of weapons testing range. Just as it was similar in design to the American Fat Man, the first Soviet bomb produced an explosive yield of 22 kilotons. It proved to be 50% more destructive than initially estimated. A letter written by the Soviet atom bomb team to Stalin at the conclusion of that triumphant first test proved interesting. It reads, quote, Comrade Stalin, Dear Yosef Vissarionovich, we heartily thank you for the high appreciation of our work, which the party, government, and you personally awarded us. Only the daily attention, care, and support that you gave us for these four-plus years of hard work have enabled us to successfully solve the task of organizing the production of nuclear energy and the creation of atomic weapons. We promise you, dear Comrade Stalin, that we will be working with even more energy and dedication on the further development of this business entrusted to us, and we shall give all our strength and knowledge to justify your confidence in us. The letter was co-signed by Lavrian Tiberia, as well as Kurchatov, Kariton, and a host of other leading Soviet scientists. But was the notoriously belligerent Stalin pleased with the letter? Not really. In true Stalin fashion, he gave scant praise to the scientists and took full credit himself for the success of the Soviet Union's atom bomb program. The Cold War heats up. The Soviets had initially intended to keep the test a secret, but they were unaware of the U.S.'s nuclear detection capabilities. On September 1st, 
a specially modified WB Super Fortress, flying under the guise of weather reconnaissance, detected nuclear fission products while flying between Japan and Alaska, shocking U.S. intelligence. By the Western powers' best estimates, it had been believed that the Soviet Union would not produce an atomic weapon until 1953. President Harry S. Truman notified the world on September 23, 1949, with the announcement, quote, we have evidence that within recent weeks, an atomic explosion occurred in the USSR. The public acknowledgement marked a definite turning point in the Cold War, in which both sides no longer had to pretend that a nuclear arms race was now underway. To re-establish atomic supremacy, the US quickly ordered the development of the hydrogen bomb, a weapon that could theoretically be hundreds of times more powerful than any previously tested. The quest for a new superbomb, ones with the power to obliterate entire nations was underway.